Thank you, Sarah, um, and thank you, Fran Rosenfeld. Thanks so much, everyone, for coming. And I also want to thank um, Susan Henshaw-Jones, who I know is not here at the museum um, this evening, but really for transforming um, this institution, which is not only beautiful, but really a center, I think, for discussion for all New Yorkers to think about all that is New York, uh, the challenges and opportunities past, present, and future. Uh, I work, as Sarah mentioned, at New America, which is a nonprofit um, nonpartisan think tank, uh, and my work specifically focuses on social entrepreneurship and innovation, and Fran and Sarah and I have been uh, conspiring for a while as to how we could join forces um, on d issues of activism um, and really thinking about how um, activists of all stripes um, have changed over time uh, from all sectors, so the public sector, the civic sector, um, and also for-profit entrepreneurs. So I think there's no better partnership for a discussion like this tonight and no better topic, I think, environmental activism um, and environmental justice, and I think the intersection of a whole range of environmental and economic issues. So, so thank you, um, and thank you, panelists. Um, I think uh, I won't, we, we've had some great introductions. I think maybe I'll just kick it off. I'd love um, for each of you to discuss a little bit about how, how, how you think of yourself as an environmental activist, um, how you think of yourself as someone who works for economic justice, and really how you came uh, to this work. So, uh, Peggy, I'd love to start with you, if that's okay. Uh, not coincidentally, you're sitting to my left. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, it's great to be here this evening with um, so many of my fellow activists. Um, I got started in this work um, after after becoming the Democratic district leader in West Harlem. And while I was organizing that campaign and reaching out for volunteers, my neighbors came to me and said, you know, there's a sewage treatment plant at 138th Street that's going to be opening, and we need you to get us jobs there. And so um, I set out with my co-leader, Chuck Sutton, at the time, and we went on a lot of radio shows, and we recruited people, and we actually got 30 people hired there. But of course, a couple of months later, the plant actually began operating, and we realized that it was spewing emissions and odors that were making people sick. Everyone along Riverside Drive was complaining, sending their kids you know, away for the weekend because the air quality was so bad, and many of those children had asthma, which it was exacerbating. And so we began an eight-year organizing campaign. Uh, mayor Koch was uh, the mayor at that time. He said, oh, this was a state-of-the-art facility. There's no problem. You and, and uh, State Senator Franz Leichter must be imagining all of this. Let me know the next time you smell something. You know, I'll get on my car and go up there, and we'll check it out. Well, <laughs> after hundreds of people coming out monthly for eight years and really um, self-educating themselves about the operations of this plant, um, how it should be better maintained. We were able to hire Barry Commoner, the noted environmentalist who passed away um, last year, to do um, a uh, a study and a report on the operations of the plant, which really gave us data and facts to really begin to hold the city accountable. And so that was our first major organizing campaign. And when you begin to take a look at your community and see these kinds of, of challenges, you really begin, it really begins to open your eyes. And so we really began to look around the community, and we realized that we also housed over one-third of the entire diesel bus fleet for New York City in uptown neighborhoods. At about the same time, this was the late 80s, we began to reach out to researchers at Columbia School of Public Health, and we said, you know, could you tell us if there are more emergency room visits coming from these zip codes that are near the plant? And then you know how researchers are, it takes a couple of years to, to do uh, the studies. But we got a call a couple of years later um, from a, a physician at Harlem Hospital. He said, you'll never guess what, we've just found that the incidence of asthma in Harlem is three times that of any other community in New York City. And that really began our foundational uh, priority issues around air quality and uh, negative health in outcomes for children. And so 
those are the seminal issues we began working on, strong campaigns. I mean, the campaign against the MTA lasted for 18 years. 18 long years. You really have to be committed to persevere, because that's a public authority that really isn't used to dealing with the community. And just to, to let you know that um, last October, we had a large celebration with the MTA because they opened the first green bus depot in the country. And this was done with a community task force we coordinated for six long years to get the MTA to build green, to build to Leeds rating, to have a green roof, to ensure that every, every bus was inside the depot. So it was a huge win for the community. And again, we now have another 20 to 25 residents who are totally self-educated, understand these issues, and are empowered to work on a whole range of other environmental activism in their communities. So we have really taken the the model of community organizing and public policy. So we work to integrate community residents into helping to develop and advocate for public policy changes. As a result, we have opened a Washington office uh, two years ago, working on federal policy around air quality and climate change. And I'll just end by saying um, th our current project is working one of our current projects um, is working on climate resilience planning for northern Manhattan. And so we have been running something called Serious Games, and we've hired a facilitator who um, is well um, versed in, in game theory, and we are developing numbers of scenarios for east, west, central Harlem, and Washington Heights, and we are convening those neighborhoods to understand the scenarios they could be confronted to, to understand the uh, responses they would have in an urgent crisis, and then begin to develop solution sets. And we've also developed a stakeholder group of uh, city agencies that will, uh, and the Department of Health, who will be meeting with us to, to kind of uh, ground truth and respond to the uh, solution sets we come up with. And we will then be working over the next three years to implement those recommendations. So that is the kind of, um, of activism and the model that, that we are employing here in northern Manhattan um, that really impacts city policy, state and federal policy as well. Thank you. For me. Um, so Enterprise is a national affordable housing organization, and we work basically in three ways. One is that we deliver capital to affordable housing projects. Um, we work on policies that enable the development and preservation of affordable housing, both nationally uh, through our policy team based in D.C., as well as in our lo 10 local markets. So here in New York, we have a local policy effort that focuses on the city and the state. Um, and then through what we call solutions, uh, which is the piece that I primarily work in. And, and by solutions, what we mean is, but basically, we do pilot programs. So we do a various um, kinds of pilot programs that usually last between two to five years. And what we're looking to do by doing the pilot programs and our solutions team is to identify uh, the best practices that work and then use our capital platform and our policy work to uh, scale up those learnings. And so, um, you know, my, when I came to Enterprise, I came to Enterprise as the first uh, uh, staff person to work on sustainability issues in our New York office. And, you know, the, the approach that, that we've taken uh, around sustainability since the launch of our sustainability initiatives in 2004 has been uh, one that's moving from uh, basically helping the people who are already at the leading edge of the industry do better to really figuring out ways to make the best practices, common practices in the field. Um, so, for example, um, when we uh, worked on our uh, national um, green communities criteria, which has been adopted by uh, 22 
cities and states as part of their, uh, the way that they um, uh, give out affordable housing funding. Um, we started off by basically working with just a handful of developers from various places around the country who were already committed to doing the, uh, adopting green building practices. And then we used um, partnerships at, with public sector uh, agencies to first incentivize. So for example, here in New York, um, we, the, the last uh, RFPs that went out for the Melrose North Urban Renewal Area, for example, were the first places where um, Enterprise provided uh, sort of a tag along, I'd say, or sort of as a right grant that would, uh, that, that encouraged people to um, develop those sites sustainably. And then the next step after that was really taking uh, the experiences of the local developers and, and basically requiring a green uh, standard as part of all of the affordable housing that gets developed here in New York. So the current state of the commitment on the affordable housing sector around sustainability is that if you're building a city-funded affordable housing project that's new construction or substantial rehabilitation, then you have to meet a green building standard that's a, real, uh, that's a high performance standard. And then uh, with, along with the announcement of the One City Built to Last plan, uh, HPD, um, our housing agency, has made a commitment, which it's now working to, um, you know, put on the ground that all of the pres preservation programs that the city has will also now be have, will now require uh, green commitments. So, you know, over the course of basically 10 years, um, the New York City has gone from having an interest in aligning sustainability and affordable housing to essentially requiring it across the board as of as of basically this year. So I think that that's probably a first uh, among cities in, in the country and certainly a, a real um, uh, a testament not only to the work of activists but also uh, the, the uh, appetite that um, the affordable housing developers have had uh, to really be the, uh, you know, be responsive to uh, situations like the asthma situation in, uh, in northern Manhattan and the Bronx where, um, you know, the housing wasn't there just to provide a roof over, you know, or shelter over people's heads, but also acknowledging that uh, the indoor environmental quality and, you know, the transit access and all of those things also really matter for, for residents. So on a, on a personal note, um, I actually am... Uh, first of all, deeply honored to share the stage with, with activists, but also kind of taken aback a little in, in, in being, in being uh, on a panel of, of activists because I'm just, in my mind, I'm just a recovering computer programmer. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I, my first professional experiences were d during the first dot-com boom. And, you know, for me, wanting to work on environmental issues um, really only came about when I recognized that uh, the sort of the urbanness of the environmental issues. And so, you know, when I was growing up, I really thought of environmentalism as being conservation. And so, you know, having, you know, had sort of half of a career in, in, in uh, programming, I, I came to a point where I was thinking about climate change and, and, uh, as, be, as being the uh, sort of generational, or certainly one of the generational problems today. And, you know, I wanted to engage in it, and I didn't want to engage in it, you know, through conservation. I wanted it to be meaningful for the experiences that I've had, had you know, I've had, I have had in as being sort of a city girl. And so once I re recognized the tie between what we do in cities and, and the impacts that it has, and that's really when I realized that there was a role that I could play even being a recovering, you know, computer programmer. <laughs> um, but... I would say that all of the work that we do at Enterprise is really built on a foundation of community development and community activism. Um, Enterprise has been working in New York for 20, I think going on 28 years, and we've really grown, the office has grown up and the activities that we've been engaged in have grown up with the community development field. And, you know, I have deep respect for, um, for community organizing, community organizers, and, and um, you know, having that strong tie to the to the, the the needs of the community and the will of the community as expressed through community development organizations and community environmental organizations, I think that's really one of the hallmarks that uh, distinguishes the way that we produce affordable housing here in, in, in this country from how affordable housing gets produced in other places. And there are any number of ways that you can structure affordable housing programs. And the fact that we do it in the way that we do it is a, not only a legacy of you know how the affordable uh, how the affordable housing community came about through a, a, a local response to, to 
you know, widespread disinvestment. Um, but it's really, I think, a, a, a core strength in the way that we do uh, affordable housing here. So something that I think we'll, we'll, we'll need to be thinking a lot about um, in the coming years as we're, we're facing, um, I think, a, probably an inflection point in the industry where many other organizations that have been really active in the sector um, are looking at their, you know, 30th and 40th anniversaries, the founding board members, the founders of the organizations are, you know, transitioning to other things. Um, and frankly, you know, we look at the portfolio owners of affordable housing and many of them have portfolios that are too small to be really economically efficient. Um, and, you know, and we're at a point where we really need to reinvest in those housing uh, portfolios to preserve them. So I think there's a big challenge ahead of us, not only an environmental one, but one of pres preserving the affordable housing wins that we've had um, to date. And I think that these two things, the environmental challenges and the preservation of affordable housing are really linked. Thank you. Um, what, what, one of the reasons we asked everyone to reflect a little, both on their personal commitments and evolutions as environmentalists and also professionals, because I think the recovering computer programming uh, profile is reminding us we're moving down the millennial spectrum here and, and, and actually really see some interesting generational shifts. So thank you for including your, your own personal tales. Um, and Ashley, if we can keep going with you. So, okay. <laughs> so um, I'm Ashley White, um, I said before, and I'm a recent graduate of Green City Forest, and I'm a current intern at the Department of Environmental Protection. Um, so Green City Forest is an AmeriCorps program, um, and they focus on um, energy efficiency and, and just overall um, sustainability. Um, so I was assigned to the, um, the 11th month team, and our main curriculum was focused around urban agriculture. Um, and so we, uh, we farmed on a one acre of land in Red Hook houses. Um, they're a NYCHA development in Brooklyn. Um, and so Red Hook um, is considered um, a food desert. Um, they also have high rates of diabetes, obesity, and asthma. Um, and also before uh, it was a farm, it was just an empty area. And there was a lot of uh, crime and gang activity um, there. And it wasn't a safe place for like you know, children to, you know, run about. Um, the, the neighbors and residents, they weren't um, really engaging with each other. Um, so the farm started in 2013, and then the second season is the season I was a part of um, with my other teammates. And um, since the farm has uh, been launched, we harvested, uh, we grew and harvested uh, 3.6 tons of food um, for Red Hook residents. Um, and we also did, I was a workshop coordinator, um, so um, I did like cooking demos and, and you know, uh, my plate to, to help them, um, you know, eat, eat better, show them better ways to, to cook um, the crops that uh, we were giving them. We also, uh, the residents volunteered with us. When we first arrived, um, the residents, they were really to themselves. Um, they were, you know, in there, they would just walk by, they wouldn't ask questions. So we had to like get in their face like, hi, we're here. This farm is for you guys. <laughs> so, um, and eventually the more that they came out, they, we, we, we told them like, we're just doing the work, but this farm is for you all. It's, it's for your community. And eventually, they would, you know, they took pride in it. They were like, hey, I grew these tomatoes. I grew these cucumbers. And, you know, it was, um, we also had a barter system with them. Um, we didn't sell, um, sell them the, uh, the, the crops, but we had a, a barter system with them. It was like, either you come and you do 30 to an hour, um, 30 minutes to an hour of service, or you uh, would bring us your compost. Um, you know, their food scraps and things like that. And um, at first, you know, like it was, it was going great, but even after the farm closed, uh, we noticed that they were still bringing us their, uh, their compost, even though they weren't getting any, getting any crops in return because the farm was down. And, you know, as we were leaving and transitioning onto um, another portion of the program, you know, the residents came. I was like, we really appreciate you guys being here. Um, the kids, you know, they really, really love being, it, being here and, you know, there's no, you know, drug, there's no gangbangers out here in front of our windows. And it, um, it really affected me 
um, because I, you know, when I came across Green City Forest, I wasn't working. Um, I just dropped out of college because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I was like, you know, I want to do finance and now I want to be a psychologist. <laughs> and and um, it never came across my mind that I wanted to, you know, be a, a part of like an, env an environmental movement. Um, and when I live in a NYCHA development in Far Rockaway, and I came across the flyer. And when I went to uh, the info session, I was really intrigued by all the work they did. They did. Uh, they they were outside a lot, which I was like, that's different from what I like to do. <laughs> but I was like, you know, I'm in New York now. I need a challenge, and I need to explore my options. Um, but you know, I came into the program, and I was like, this is cool. But I'm going to be a cosmetologist. I'm not going to. Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll plant flowers and stuff. But no, I'm still going to paint faces. That's what I want to do. And literally now, I can't imagine ever like you know going to beauty school or anything else. It's like all I think about, like I'm constantly with my friends talking about environmental injustice and food injustice. And I'm like, hey guys, it's Saturday, let's go composting. And they're like, <laughs> no. <laughs> so um, being a, a young person, um, in, and now like I'm, I'm interning at the Department of Environment and Protection and um, we do mostly outreach, but it's still, we still uh, have a close connection with NYCHA residents. And as going on in Green City Forest and with DEP, you know, you, you start to learn about a lot of the problems in those communities or, you know, in, in the buildings. And I feel like me as a young person, I feel like a lot of, you know, older people, they feel like we're young, we don't understand the issues and, and the things that are happening in our communities. But through programs like Green City Forest and through young people like me, I feel like just because we live in those areas doesn't mean we don't have to care about it or we you know it's it's the projects we don't need flowers and gardens and vegetables and there's a lack of i guess like hope in, in education but i feel like through the work i've done and the work that i'm going to continue to do i feel like i can get more young people um interested in in the things that are uh, affecting us especially um as far as environmental uh, injustice goes. So, yeah. Thank you. I can't, fo I can't follow it's those a, guys. I think, we follow. Should, I think we should change the question. And, yeah, um, so, so, so my name's uh, Danelle Baird. Um, I used to be a community organizer, and now I run a for-profit venture capital-backed uh, startup. Um, and I guess what's the, the reason I would be here is to talk about why that happened or what my justification is for that. Um, so, so, so I grew up in Bed-Stuy back when it was still a terrible neighborhood, not like it is now, and, you know, saw a bunch of shootings, um, you know, drug deals gone wrong where one 16-year-old would shoot another one in the face across the street from me um, and my sister. And it was a really tough neighborhood, and that stayed with me. Um, so after I graduated from college, um, I you know, graduated from Duke and decided to move back to Brooklyn. I moved to Brownsville, which is um, one of the poorest uh, census tract or zip codes in the city, and became a community organizer for three years. Um, I, I, I learned a ton about formal, you know, Saul Alinsky style community organizing and what it's like to talk with neighborhood leaders to, to, to push for public policy, although I could never hope to have 1 20th of the accomp accomplishments of Peggy, um, uh, who, who, who really represents the best of that tradition. I, um, around that time, Obama decided that he was going to run for president. I thought that um, if he played his cards right, that he could win South Carolina, like John Edwards, and then he could be a, a great vice president for Hillary, and uh, <laughs> that that would be like a good example for all the African-American children in the neighborhood where I was an organizer. They could look up to the first black vice president, which tells you why I'm terrible at politics. So <laughs> I, I, left, I, left my, I, I left community organizing in Brownsville to join the campaign. Once we won, my assignment was actually um, one of the green jobs portions of the stimulus. And so if everybody goes back in the time machine back to 2008, Just Juan had this great inauguration speech, 
speech, the, the economy is collapsing, and one of the things that the administration had decided to do was to invest something like $80 billion in lots of new uh, solar and energy efficiency technologies to kind of, as part of the capital injection into the economy. And so that was my assignment, was to kind of, you know, go around the country and negotiate with governors and mayors um, and local community groups around how they were going to use their portion of the stimulus that they were allocated to create green jobs in their municipality. So I did this for about three years, and we were able to win lots of significant local policy victories, but part of the idea at the time was that we were going to take something like $7 billion of stimulus dollars and combine it with capital from utility companies and Wall Street banks. And we were going to create this self-sustainable clean energy and energy efficiency industry that was going to kind of retrofit 100 million American buildings and you know, dramatically reduce carbon emissions. It's a great idea, right? Well, some of it worked, some of it didn't. Most of it didn't. Um, in particular, the big investment banks at that time were not prepared to make investments in clean energy at scale for, you know, to retrofit American buildings. Um, so I spent three years doing that um, and saw this huge opportunity to create green jobs for you know, folks in the communities that I care about, like Ashley and others, um, but, but, but saw that finance played a critical role in what was possible. And at the same time, I'm just really tickled that you're a computer programmer. I just didn't know that. But, um, you know, really started to think about you know, Silicon Valley and the fact that you know, half of us are going to walk out of here and call an Uber to go home. And you know, five years ago, that that wasn't the case, right? Or two years ago, that wasn't the case. So, so how do you think about taking the best parts of the tradition of community organizing and social activism and com combining them with the kind of ability to s build and scale and deploy new technologies that Silicon Valley has to offer us, right? And, 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 and how do you think about those two traditions and, and, and create an opportunity to create a scalable, uh, you know, for-profit company that can help us reduce carbon emissions at scale. So that's what we're trying to do at our startup. Um, think about how you leverage community organizing and community relationships with, you know, churches and synagogues and building owners that Bomi works with at Enterprise and that Peggy deals with in her organizing and in public housing where Ashley's from. How do you create a huge portfolio of uh, buildings uh, that Deutsche Bank or Goldman Sachs Urban Investment Group feels comfortable lending, you know, five, ten million dollars to at five or six percent uh, to to install solar panels and energy efficiency and in you know, new boilers? I don't know if any of you saw the um, article in the Times yesterday. There's an article on boilers in the Bronx. I believe that the key to dealing with climate change in the United States is plumbers and boilers. Um, and if you think about it, you know, if we're burning all these fossil fuels, you know, upstate and then running it through these crazy pipes and then, you know, bringing it here and then we're burning the boilers, they're all 50 years old. They're causing really high asthma rates in Harlem and the Bronx, um, which is horrible for kids, parents, communities. Um, but you know, they're just spewing carbon emissions into the air. And they're all oversized. They all need to be replaced. And, and, and no one can afford to replace them in, in, in most parts of the city. And so there's just thousands and thousands of buildings across New York City uh, that have a boiler that's 40 years old. They could reduce their energy bill by you know, 50 60%, um, but they just don't have the access to engineers and the access to capital that would allow them to, to, to save money and do something that's often awesome for the climate. And do something that would create local jobs in the communities that need it the most. So our company um, works with churches and synagogues and nonprofits to, um, and small businesses and multifamily buildings to, to figure out how to do community scale retrofits um, and install solar panels and new you know, software technologies that can, can help bring down energy consumption. So thank you. So I want to um, ask, and then and then I'm going to open up because I know there are um, a ton of interested questions and questioners. But I want to just um, have everyone briefly reflect. Maybe I ah, will go back again. This one, but um, uh, brief, briefly reflect on two things. So you're all getting at different issues, um, different but related issues of in environmental activism, environmental justice, um, and the economic pieces of that in different ways. Um, it's all a lot of hard work, and, and you've all made progress in a huge amount of ways, but there's still obstacles. So I guess to the extent that you could um, reflect a little bit on what you see, I mean, some of you fight government, some of you use government, some of you 
uh, need more capital, some of you need more regulations, if you could just think, if you could sort of change one thing that would make some of your work easier. And, and also, who, who, have some, who are some of your allies that you think about when you, when you go to work each day? Are they people along this panel, along the stage? Are there people um, in other parts of New York? Are there people in other parts of the country, in other parts of the world? Pay. Can I begin with you? <laughs> it's, an sure. easy, it's an easy six-part question. <laughs> So what are some of the challenges? Um, so the, the challenges are, are one, that government isn't used to dealing with, with community, um, that community residents are, are not in the pipeline to, um, to, to be in places to testify, to, um, to be on important commissions that impacts things like um, our water, like the water board, our, our water prices. Um, so we really have to um, make sure that residents are empowered, informed, so that they can begin to take action on their own to really have sustainable neighborhoods. We then need government agencies that are willing to um, have that kind of rapport and work to develop consensus in communities. So, you know, I'll give you one example. Um, we found out that the city, you know, at the time uh, the Hudson River Park was getting started, the Brooklyn Bridge Park was getting started under Bloomberg, and we realized that waterfront uh, parks were um, really uh, very possible throughout the city. But at 125th Street, we had a uh, waterfront where the piers had fallen into the water, Fairway was using it as a uh, parking lot, there was trash everywhere, and we heard that the city was going to, to develop a hotel there. And we said, well, gee, um, everybody's getting a park where families can go and have recreation and enjoy the wonderful natural resource of the Hudson River, and why can't we have that too? And so we developed a community-based planning project because it's, you know, environmental justice isn't just about stopping the bad stuff. It's about bringing the green benefits to communities that have been underserved. So we began a planning process with 200 residents, and we were able to develop um, a plan for a park. We were able to uh, have a campaign for two years to get the city to build that park, to get the city to hold off from releasing a RFP to a developer until they saw what the community plan was. And so what we really did was we made it easy for the city because we developed consensus within the community with all of our elected officials, with our community boards, with, you know, civil society, so that the, uh, the city could just come in and really be the winner here, uh, really be able to develop a consensus project that was a win for everyone. And that uh, West Harlem Pierce Park was that last segment that really connected the Hudson River Park to Riverside Park uh, ab above 145th Street. So if you were riding your bike up uh, Riverside Park, you had to, to stop at 124th or LaSalle Place, get out and walk your bike up to about 145th Street. And so we were able, in uh, really bringing this resource to our community, really provide a resource for the entire city. And so I think what the city realized was that this was a great way to interact with communities. And so they began taking that model elsewhere in the, in the city and began working, for instance, with the Bronx River process. And that's been a wonderful process um, over the last few years. But again, government understanding that community can be a resource, a consensus builder, and an excellent partner. So we've been able to partner with the city on clean heat. Um, you heard Danelle reference the New York Times article because something like 80% of greenhouse gas emissions in New York City are being emitted by buildings. And so getting uh, those building and boiler retrofits happening, now that's happened on uh, Park Avenue, um, because those co-ops there, 
people said, my God, we didn't realize we were part of the problem. We didn't realize that we had really bad air because of what our buildings emitted. And so those buildings were able to be the first adopters and to really transform. But it's been the other buildings um, owned by landlords in lower income communities where those landlords may not be getting the revenue they need, um, or maybe they're just absentee landlords who don't care. But at any result, they have not had the, um, the access to capital to make the reforms they need. And then the unintended consequence of all that is that tenants might get a major capital improvement, um, you know, uh, expense added to their rent in perpetuity. So um, again, we've got to really incentivize uh, the right behavior, the behavior we want, um, and we're not quite doing that yet. And so that's really an obstacle. How do we incentivize uh, the behavior that really will make our communities and our city sustainable? Thank you. Um, are there other obstacles? I'm a very half empty, glass half empty person. I see challenges everywhere. Um, so, <laughs> but I'll just hit on three, three things, yeah. So, um, you know, I, 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 I do want to point out that, um, you know, from the, con in the, pr from the perspective of affordable housing, I, I, I want to sort of point out that um, when you look at the history of green building, which is a fairly short one in New York, but if, when you look at the history of green building in New York, affordable housing has been an in the lead in, in practically every way. Um, you know, the first uh, Energy Star homes were affordable housing buildings. The f you know, the first, multi and, and that was, you know, 15 years ago, um, the first passive house, multifamily passive house buildings are affordable housing buildings in, in, um, uh, in Crown Heights. And so, I, you know, I, I, I think that there's an expectation um, among folks who are not in, in our industry that, um, affordable, that green must be expensive, that it must be for sort of, you know, more luxury type housing and that affordable housing, you know, must just be left behind. But I, I want to point out that when you have the opportunity, when you have the capital, when you're building new, affordable housing buildings are arguably better, probably, than, than, than most market rate developments. Um, so having said that, I do think that there are some real, um, meaty challenges that we're going to you know, be able to chew on for a while. And one of them is just what happens not 10 years from now, but after, you know, after 2025, right? So you know, we have this very ambitious climate goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 80% um, you know, by, by 2050. And I think that generally speaking, we're, we're more generally agreed that getting to like 30% by 2025 is more or less like the path that we're on, like, you know, we're, we're doing the things that we need to be able to, to get there and, you know, there'll be incremental improvements in what we do, but by and large, the new buildings that we build are, are pretty good. Um, and where the challenge it lies is in that sort of, um, if you look at, you know, if you break it out by um, basically, you know, quintiles, the worst quintile has to, by the time, in order to be able to meet the 2050 goal, the worst quintile has to reduce what the, the greenhouse gases by 65%, right? So, I mean, that's, kind, that's a big number. It's a big challenge, particularly sen you know, since we're talking about buildings that are resource constrained. And so I think, you know, the, so, um, and then, so the, the long range picture is really challenging. And I think that we need to be, you know, doing everything that we can with the things that we know how to do today, but then really start very, very soon to think about, well, what are the big wins that we need to have in place 10 years from now? How do we move, you know, the conversations around having a world-class BRT? How do we really start to think about density in a way that is, you know, based on collaboration and responsive to, you know, local needs, but at the same time recognizing that the places that are dense already in New York City are 
dense already, and that you know, additional density, if we're going to you know, continue to grow, needs to be able to go into places that are currently not as dense. And so you know, these are difficult conversations to have. It's, they're, they're very difficult you know, individually at the community level. So I think th that's all very scary stuff. And then the future of NYCHA, right? That's another you know, big looming crisis. Did I just say I was going to do three? I guess I'm doing more than three. I apologize. I, I lumped it all together into lo big long-term post-2025 challenges that we need to be thinking about today. Um, the second thing that I deal with really a lot, on a <laughs> on a <laughs> just to be you know, inclusive, um, the second thing that I, I think about a lot on a day-to-day -day basis um, in the work that we do with the existing buildings today in retrofitting them is um, sort of figuring out the right balance of attention between, I guess, what I would call hardware and then people. So building performance basically depends on envelope performance, mechanicals performance, operator behavior, and resident behavior. That, you know, those four things are it. And we have a really good, um, we, we, we have, we, we focus primarily on mechanicals efficiency, right? We, we don't feel, it, and this is in the retrofit space particularly, we don't really feel like we can do much about envelope performance by and large. Um, we haven't seen deep energy retrofits really happen in New York City yet. Hopefully that's you know, on the horizon, but it's, it's yet to come. We have sort of started thinking about operator behavior, but probably not enough. Um, and we, we have a hard time figuring out how to engage with the residents and sort of you know, particularly how to foster communication so that they are understanding that they are part of the machine, right? And that their behavior is also, you know, what drives the overall building performance. And so I think, so, so sort of recognizing sort of the, the, the hardware, so the building bits and, and the role of the, the people, I think is, is also, um, uh, you know, a, a challenge. Um, and, then, uh, and then I can be really short on my third one because I know Donnell is going to go there. Um, and, and that's... Um, Figuring out, you know, there's a lot of conversations uh, going on right now about how to use opportunities like um, the, the reforming the energy vision process that's happening at the state level um, to create mechanisms to build real community equity it, through, you know, doing, um, you know, renewable, uh, distributed renewable, gen, you know, distributed generation through renewables and sort of, you know, being able to retrofit buildings at scale and things like this, um, we ha you know, there's not. A, this isn't something where like somebody has, has figured this out and we just have to sort of replicate it in New York. It's really something that um, that we need to build and uh, you know build a car as we drive it, as it as it were. Um, and so I think um, that's very challenging. And I think that particularly the uh, the reason why. I and my colleagues at Enterprise are thinking about this is not because, not, you know, it's, it's probably because it's, it's green and, you know, we're, we're big sustainability people, but it's also because, you know, community development uh, has been with us for 30, 40 years. It is fragile, right? Uh, those of us who work in community development can think of three or four pieces of, you know, like policy that if they were different, uh, we would be undercut in a really significant way. Um, and even now, when you look at community development organizations, they're, you know, they're, they're very much resource constrained and, and many of them are forced to go from sort of crisis to crisis, right? In whether it's in, in property management or, or in responding to changing uh, funding streams and what have you. And so, um, you know, if there's, if, if there's an opportunity for there to be economic activity generated from the way that, you know, really radical shifts in how we think about um, energy and greenhouse gases, then, you know, what, what great opportunity to be able to plug in the community development industry there so that we can, you know, the sustainability of the field as a whole uh, could be improved, financial sustainability of the field could be improved. Great, thank you. Um, and it didn't have to be just a negative half full question. Part of it was about obstacles, but also if there are, um, in addition to obstacles in your work, if there are bright spots and, you know, partners that you expected or didn't who've been helpful in your work. Um, Ashley, would love you to win. Thanks. Um, as far as obstacle goes, obstacles go. Um, well, for myself personally, um, I feel like I'm in the infant stages of like my activism, so I'm still learning a lot. Um, and and another thing is trying to place like my focus. I know, you know, dealing um, with Green City Forest, we dealt with NYCHA, and now I'm still. Um, with DP, I'm still involved with uh, with NYCHA developments and residents, but it's like, what 
you know, do I, you know, want to do, I learned about, um, I learned about <coughs> green building and the lead and, and all those classes at Solar One. And I was wondering like, well, maybe I could, you know, have the, uh, the, the plumbers and the maintenance guys like go through new green building training. And I was like, well, I don't know how to go about that. And I was like, well, maybe I can, um, you know, get, start like, um, you know, like an RGC or like, like where I live. And, and it's like, it's, it's for me, it takes, I'm still learning um, a lot. And um, I feel like my allies are, you know, my superiors because they have a lot more experience than me. Um, and they're very passionate about the work that they do. Um, so I feel like it, when I continue to, to grow and, um, and, um, and learn, I can find like a, a set focus, but I know definitely it's to preserve NYCHA and also to, to beautify it. Um, and another obstacle I noticed is, um, is the residents. Um, sometimes, um, a lot of times I, I do notice like a pattern with, with the residents in order to really see a change or get them, let's say I'm bringing a program um, into Van Dyke per se. And it's like, you know, we're just gonna pass out flyers and it, it's not gonna, oh, the residents aren't gonna be like, oh yeah, we're totally on board. Let's do this. Da, da, da. It t I feel like it takes a constant presence for them to, because there's, there's like this battle against the residents in NYCHA because, you know, every time I live there and there's always problems during the winter, there's no heat, but when the summertime is here, they want to cut it on. Or when there's plumbing problems, they have to turn the, the water off for like two days. Or like you just recently, a few months ago, we didn't have a working shower for like almost two weeks. And it's, you know, it's difficult to want to, you know, why should we help NYCHA? Why should we help them get their energy costs down? Why should we, you know, clean up? Why, you know, it's very, it's like this battle between NYCHA and the residents. So I feel like with the presence that we had at the farm and when you're constantly in an, um, in a certain space, you start to encourage the other people who are there. So it's like, I wanna maybe, you know, start some groups in certain NYCHA developments to encourage other people. Cause you know, people think they don't care about us. They don't even wanna, you know, they don't wanna fix our sink. They don't wanna turn on the heat, da 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 da. And I feel like it's more just encouraging the residents to take pride in where they live. And, you know, and not, it's, it's more than just, you know, not throwing trash on the ground or this and that, but it's like, you know, get some, you know, some, some gardens going, you know, get some, you know, just growing your own vegetables alone can solve a lot of problems. More than likely, if you live in a NYCHA development, you live in an area that could possibly be a food desert. If, when you go to NYCHA buildings or areas around it, you see bodegas, uh, liquor stores, things like that. There's no Whole Foods next to any NYCHA developments that I know. You know, <laughs> and, and, and more than likely, uh, most, a lot of New Yorkers depend on public transportation. So it's not like me, I'll, I do it just because I like being in the city. But who is going to travel all the way to Union Square, stand in line for like half an hour to pay for your groceries, and then travel all the way to Brooklyn or Queens or, you know, Far Rockaway or wherever you live? You know, it's all about convenience, and, and it's it's a it's a lot of issues as far as food injustice goes. But just growing your crops alone will help you with your health, and just you know get you outside and get you going and getting the residents together. Like one one thing with the farm is at first I noticed the residents weren't engaged; they really didn't mind. But as the uh, the season went on, so there's no gate around the farm it's like free space so you just have all these vegetables you can just we we tell them it's for you but we we didn't want them to harvest when we weren't there because it can possibly damage the crops um so sometimes some people just didn't want to they didn't want to bring compost they didn't want to volunteer they're like we just want our okra just give us eggplants <laughs> and and so what they started doing the residents started telling on each other so uh, we got to the farm Monday and we noticed our okra was a little 
lopsided. And um, the day goes on, we're just trying to fix it. We know somebody was in there harvesting incorrectly. This guy opens up his window, hey, hey. And we're like, yes. I was like, you see those ladies on the bench right there? They took your okra. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, if someone, I'm telling you, you couldn't get away with nothing. It was like, that guy threw his cigarette down in a pumpkin bed. I mean, they're just <laughs> screaming and telling on each other. But it helped. Like, we weren't, you know. We weren't coming to the farm with these lopsided crops and it was less trash. I mean, they would go in and it's like, it took us a while, you know? And I feel like if we just came and handed out flyers and was like, oh yeah, recycle, bye. It, you know, it, there is no, you know, but we were there for like so long. And when they, you know, everyone in our program was from a night of development. And I feel like actually being, living there we sense of, like, we know what you're going through. And it's just generally, a lot of people in NYCHA feel like just people just genuinely don't care. You know, politicians are what they may come, they take some pictures, like, we're here, and then they leave, and then it's like, you know, there are no changes, like, nothing came, you know. But um, I feel like an, an obstacle is, is, is mostly just, um, is getting through to uh, to them because a lot of the ideas that um, you know we have can work if we can just um, show some genuine concern and uh, get some spark in them. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Now, ne next time you can you can sit on this end because <laughs> it's a tough set of acts. But try your best. Yeah. Uh. No, I think, um, I mean, Ashley, I think on the issue of climate change, I think that many people, you know, like NYCHA residents also feel really frustrated and feel like they're, they're not sure what they can do to get the kind of changes that they want to see. I think that, um, you know, climate change is important to so many people. And um, I think that there there is a frustration, certainly at the federal government, at federal government level and maybe even at the local level, I know that at the local level, the mayor's made these tremendous commitments. And so we've talked about, you know, what's the implementation, right? Like the, the devil's in the details and what's it actually going to take to get there. It's one thing to set a huge vision. It's another thing to, to implement it. I think that, you know, as Bomi mentioned, to his credit, Cuomo has taken a significant national leadership role in trying to force utility companies in New York State to move to a business model that is not based on new investments in fossil fuels. He has, right? And um, incentivizing them to, 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 to see the profitability in installing uh, distributed solar uh, and clean energy technologies in New York City. That's what the man has done. So you may not like what he's done on ethics reform or whatever, right? But on, 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 on energy and fossil fuels, he, he is pushing for significant changes. But again, the, the devil is going to be in the details of the implementation. I think at the national level, what can I say? I mean, our, our startup was fortunate. You know, I, I graduated from Columbia Business School, and we were able to win a contract with the Department of Energy to focus on um, the retrofits of small commercial buildings in um, New York City. So I, I'm certainly not going to you know, criticize my biggest customer. It's not a joke. Um, <laughs> I think that 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 you know what they're doing with the EPA and coal, coal, coal plants is, is is significant. I think at all levels, right? As as New Yorkers, we we're the beneficiaries of a local, state, and federal government that is you know doing the best it can in, in some ways on climate. But I still think that you know lots of us feel really really frustrated with. Um, the, the lack of like a really bold vision and really tremendous pr progress in a specific plan with a lot of resources and political mind and political will. It reminds me of um, you know, one of my favorite movies, uh, Spielberg's Lincoln, and he's trying to you know, abolish slavery and free all the slaves and do this really awesome thing. And at the end of the day, he has to hire these two guys to basically literally run around and bribe all the congressmen. And you know, the, the, the guys are running after the congressmen saying, you know, you know vote to abolish slavery. And you know, if you lose, 
Will Mickey the Postmaster General of Ohio, right? Because there's these very narrow parochial interests that are preventing something grand and large and significant from happening. I think on climate change, many of us feel that way. Um, I think, for me, here in one of the most powerful neighborhoods and one of the most powerful cities on the planet, um, there is an opportunity for us to really lead. Um, I think we spoke about the needs of financially underserved communities in New York, um, not as charity cases, but that if we can think about how do we meet our self-interest as people who are interested in making a difference on climate change and carbon emissions reductions, uh, and what are the things that we can do to, to help facilitate or enable um, large-scale large investments in you know, carbon emissions reductions and energy efficiency reductions and solar power in uh, the Bronx and in the Rockaways and um, out in Brownsville where I was a community organizer. I think that's what's on the table for us. This is all a backdoor pitch for my company, by the way, so whatever. Um, the, 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 the way that we think about it is that government can set the table, right, for a set of policies, uh, but then it's going to be up to the private sector and the civic sector to really come up with a set of solutions that's going to scale quickly enough um, to actually allow us to address climate change in a significant way. Um, so, 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 so government's going to be a huge partner in that, but there's just lots and lots of things that we're going to have to do as you know, American citizens and New Yorkers to, to really lead the way on this stuff. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right, let's open it up because I know um, lots of questions. I, I, yeah. I got more, but I want to I wanna give everyone else a chance to get. I'll bring you the mic if you have a question. Thank you. My question really was uh, prompted by Peggy Shepard's description of her work, very impressive as all of you are. You talked about how things take three years, six years, eight years, and this is the way change happens. I have two questions about it. First of all, how do you keep people motivated in community areas to continue to work when the payoff is so far down the line in a society where we're all used to sort of instant gratification? And secondly, specifically in the area of climate change, when the most activist people are saying, this is something that can't wait. You know, the, the climate is, I mean, this is urgent. How are you going to wait six or eight years uh, to make it pay off and not lose people's support and have them go off and do something much less valuable? Yeah. So in terms of climate change, um, certainly Congress has not moved ahead. And one of the reasons that we think that the environmental community really lost out on the McCain-Lieberman bill was the lack of diversity in the environmental movement. Amen. And that's been a very, big, very big issue. Um, right now, you're seeing all of the major mainstream environmental groups hiring diversity managers, develop de developing strategic plans around diversity, because they understand that they are at the table making decisions for all of us, yet all of our voices are not being heard. And, and that they can't are, win without us. And they can't win without everyone. Right. And of course, looking at the changing demographics, um, unfortunately, that seems to be the big driver, not simply the value that all of our uh, opinions and experiences and perspectives are valued and are needed to craft the, poli the kinds of policies that are really going to uh, ensure sustainability. So as a result, we have seen the EPA move ahead, the Clean Power Rule, which um, is part of, the, uh, of Obama's uh, climate change plan, is being promulgated. Um, it will be devolved, uh, the authority will be devolved through the states. So the action is really going to be at the state level with all of the states developing the regulatory implementation for the plan. So we are really working to, um, we've developed a 33-member coalition around the country of EJ groups, and we are regranting to some of those to do really deep work in the states to ensure that the states have the best implementation plan so that we have the best national plan that really um, reduces uh, carbon. 
And I'm sorry, the first question was, how do you keep people motivated? Keep people motivated? That's right. Well, number one, most people have never really been fully engaged in something that impacts their community and their life. So you really can't discount the idea that when people are engaged, um, it really changes the way they see themselves and their community. For instance, uh, we had about 100 members at the climate march. And when I looked around at not only young and older people who were with us in the march, I realized that most of them had never, ever done anything like that. And just how transformative it was for young folks from Brother, Sister, Soul and older, elderly folks who are out there marching in the street talking about the impact that changing um, what we're doing around climate would really make in their communities. And so that was very empowering. It was motivating. So some of those same mem members had a teach-in before the climate march. Um, we now have a, a work group of people who are still working to develop those issues. So again, um, that's a motivator. Having short-term victories is a motivator. Um, you know, when we brought the community together around the West Harlem Piers, the fact that within two years, we had our elected officials saying, yes, we support this. Having the mayor say, yes, we support this, and we're going to build it, and we're going to develop an advisory group of community residents to advise us as we move ahead. Those things are very um, transformative for communities, and it keeps everyone going. I know, you know, it keeps me going when I, you know, get up every morning and I, I can look out at the Harlem Piers and, and know that we've created a great resource or that I can see that every bus in New York City is now uh, a hybrid diesel or uh, compressed natural gas. Those things keep me going. Yeah. And it keeps the average resident going as well. And now our neighbors realize that all they have to do is get, the, get their next door neighbor involved. And uh, one of the things we realized in the climate resilience planning meetings we've been having at every table, at every meeting, what I have heard is the lack of social cohesion. The lack of social cohesion. And not just, you know, what happens in an emergency if I'm stuck on the 20th floor, but how do I work with my neighbors so that if someone is stuck on the 20th floor with no elevator, no electricity, that we can come together in some sort of unity to work those issues out while we're waiting for the city or, you know, the other emergency responders. But social cohesion is, is something that nobody's trying to fund. The city is getting, you know, the millions to get people back in their homes, you know, out in Coney Island and, and the Rockaways. But I keep saying to them, what kind of money, what kind of support is going to go to the groups on the ground that kept, um, the food coming, that kept uh, doing the volunteer work that kept people going in the Rockaways in Coney Island when all of the stores were closed, when the subways and buses weren't working, when they couldn't get to a drugstore that was open to get their medication. It was those groups on the ground and it was neighbors helping neighbors. And so how do we really incentivize and support and sustain um, that kind of social cohesion in a city like New York City. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Uh, is that on? Okay. I, I can talk now. Uh, I'm from Iowa. I've been living there for 40 years. Before moving there, oh, before moving there, I, I stayed in New York City for two years. So during the early 70s. When I came back, I was excited to see the city vibrant. Then I realized uh, in my seven month of stay as a caregiver to a cancer patient, uh, having a lot of time in my hand, uh, walking around the city, oh my gosh, what's going on with this state, which is 18 times larger than the urban population of Iowa, where I do live. And unfortunately, we do carry a lot of undeserved 
political power. Uh, I see that you have uh, one of your super fund side. Uh, and I, let me just qualify who I am. I'm a director general of Energy and Environment Research Group. And I was uh, advisor and I still am to privately to the senators who come to me and seek uh, environmental advice on international and national level. Uh, and I have met all the uh, other presidential candidates, some of them perhaps slept in my house. So I know what you're going through is not really helping the way you are handling it. And I'm sorry the way I'm saying it like that because the friend is somebody who tells you the truth. An enemy is the one who said that, oh, I wanted to tell you the nice way. So uh, why is that nothing moving on in New York City or New York State? It's very simple because things are handled too much by the committees. Uh, the best approach to most everything is a power of one sometimes and not necessarily involving the community. This, this is about the Superfund sites? Yes, yes. That the Superfund sites aren't moving forward? That's well, the we question. Well, have tons of sites in New York and I could actually show you some of the sites without remediation that have been built over. So, okay. think, so is it a question for the panelists about yeah, the Superfund? Yeah, the panel is why yeah. is taking you to clean up, for example, in this estate and this town to not being able to clean up one super fun side super fun after 25, I'm oh sorry, say 27 years while we have done for the rest of the nation in less than two years, mm -hmm. almost 1,500. What, why is New York City unable to take care of cleaning up its super fun sites? But I'm not going to try to answer that question, <laughs> but, but I think that one of you can. So, <laughs> <laughs> and do you mean Superfund or Brownfields? Well, Brownfield is a kind of a, yes. uh, a snake oil for the Superfund side. Unfortunately, Ms. Browner, with the all good intention, did a blank check to some of the most polluter right. Well, this, you know, the Superfund reauthorization bill, just quickly in Congress, just doesn't have enough money to clean up all of the sites. No, you don't need money because it has a provision in it which it calls cost recovery. I wrote almost all the room for this. Hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you. Can I? Well, I don't know. That's my answer. So. Yeah, a, a lot of it uh, has to do with the state legislature and the state um, Superfund and Brownfields law, but it's complicated. Yeah. In front, right here. I guess just following up on um, what um, Danelle said about government sets the table, um, the question is Manhattan above 96th Street um, and all the other boroughs don't seem to be invited to that table. Mm -hmm. um, even when the discussion comes up about preservation, it's sort of, it's a battle downtown and no one looks at the fact that in Washington Heights, Northern Manhattan, in West Harlem, nothing's preserved. And I guess my question is, how do we get the conversation to include not only all these other communities who have a vested interest? Because all I hear about affordable housing is when they, you know, looked at locations, they forgot about the fact that, you know, at least in Harlem, we have five gardens that weren't paid attention to when they selected the sites and sent out the RFQs. So I guess. My question to the panel or to the government, if you're the one token person from the city, how do we get consideration of everybody who's not invited to the table to be brought to that table? Well, you've got to get yourself to the table. Um, just two nights ago, actually, uh, a woman named Valerie Bradley um, and Yuan Chen held a meeting to develop a new historic preservation group here in uh, northern Manhattan. And so um, people are beginning to organize um, because you've got to be your own advocate. Um, people don't necessarily invite you to the table. Um, generally, you've fought your way there. And you have developed the kinds of recommendations and the kind of consensus that makes um, government's life a little easier and so they then want you to be there. 
So, um, you know, for instance, uh, there are two environmental justice folks on the Mayor's Sustainability Advisory Board. Um, that would not have happened many years ago. Um, we have worked in, in Harlem to preserve a number of sites, and um, we had an advocate who used to go down to uh, the Landmarks Preservation Society, and uh, I think I went with him um, 10 or 15 years ago, and, you know, we were chained to, to you know, the, the table there, and we weren't going to move uh, until they decided to, um, uh, to grant preservation to some of the uh, neighborhoods in Hamilton Heights, for instance. So a lot of that, and I'd love to hear from everybody here who, who has had to fight their way to the table. Um, it, it really is uh, developing the, ag uh, the advocacy and the organizing to, to make your voice heard. I'm not going to speak as a city planning commissioner, but I mean, that's not <laughs> what commissioners, uh, you know, what our role is. So, um, but on the issue of how to, you know, how you can engage, I think that, you know, so I also serve on the board of Asian Americans for Equality. And, um, you know, I think that one of the things that, I mean, and many organizations have really continued to strike this balance, but, you know, I, I know, I'm going to speak about AFI because I, I, I know it better than other organizations. And I think that one of the, you know, I, I talked earlier about sort of the roots that community development organizations in New York have in activism. And AFI, for example, has maintained that, hit, that, that connection to activism, right? So, you know, on the one hand, AFI is a, you know, a very capable and nationally recognized affordable housing organization that, you know, really is an efficient manager of uh, and developer of affordable housing. Um, but at the same time, you know, there, we, the, the organization continues to have an organizing arm. It continues to have, you know, a, a legal aid, you know, type uh, you know, community service activities that keep going on. And so I think that, you know, this is what I mean when I say that, you know, we really have a unique history in the way that we do affordable housing development here that's very tied to the community. So I think that, you know, figuring out ways that we can, you know, preserve that tradition, you know, for the future is really important. And, you know, I, and I do sort of believe, you know, feel very um, strongly that, um, you know, that we can't take that infrastructure, that civic infrastructure that we have in the city for granted. Um, you know, these are organizations that are, um, you know, very, you know, they're, they're in many cases, you know, fragile organizations and, you know, they're, um, you know, being small for, you know, is, it kind of goes along with being, uh, you know, very locally community-based. Um, and that's a tension that, you know, we continue to have to, to negotiate. So I think that, you know, supporting community, you know, that, you know, the community development corporations and the community organizations that um, still provide that really strong local connection is really important. Yeah, I mean, I'm struck by the story that Ashley shared earlier about, um, you know, wor working with NYCHA residents um, who, 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 who um, became very defensive of their vegetables in the community garden. <laughs> and um, I, think, I think what's cool about the story is that, um, you know, illustrates one of the central principles of community organizing, which is that you work with neighborhood leaders, leaders around something that's in their self-interest. And... Um, I think a lot of times, particularly in the in the environmental movement, we have a tendency to talk about kind of the, the abstract, uh, communicate on an abstract, idealistic level about you know climate change and things are happening and our grandkids and this and that. Um, and it can be tough for you know parts of the city that are uh, struggling with more immediate concerns um, to to prioritize. Um, working on policies that impact the, those kind of abstract concepts. But if you, if, if the, the role of a good community organizer or activist um, is to, to find ways to meet the direct needs of communities above 96th Street, where I live on 127th. And what, what I found in my time is that, you know, the unemployment rate is really high. And lots of the boiler replacements and solar panel installations that we need to bring down carbon emissions in the city are going to require a ton of new jobs. And, you know, the communities that need the most boiler replacements and need the most solar panels need the most jobs. And, 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 and to tie it all together, um, you know, one of the roles of city and federal and state government is to, to make the investments that allow us to hire people um, who then have a self-interest in climate change, right? It's because not only they're benefiting in terms of uh, their, the, the future of their planet and leaving 
you know, being a good steward for their grandkids, but now they have a job, and, and, and or just like growing, growing their vegetables, they, they have a reason to really start to, to listen and learn and kind of participate in the, in the conversations, you know, civic conversations, or pay attention to what's going on in the news. Because, so for example, um, we cut a deal with the mayor of DC for $100 million to train and hire um, ex-offenders to install solar panels and energy efficiency retrofits in the poorest neighborhoods in DC. And those ex-offenders not only gained a set of construction and electrical skills uh, and were trained to kind of understand building efficiency at a pretty high level, uh, but they actually became really politically active as climate leaders, right? Because their job and their paycheck and their family's health insurance was tied in with all of the local uh, and, and, and national policies that impacted climate change. And so, you know, th they were watching CNN and they were emailing me, hey, you know, Senator so-and-so just said some nonsense on the floor about <laughs> how climate change is not real and we need to visit him. And, you know, and they would. And so, so <laughs> and, you know, sometimes they say we need to visit him with a, with a baseball bat in the trunk. But, you know, you're like, that's not how you go to a senator's office. Um, you want to, but you can't or else you'd go back to jail. Anyway, the, <laughs> <laughs> the point is that, that we met their self-interest, and so that, that was a way for them to, to have a real reason to always fight to be at the table in a, in a way um, that even after I left that work in DC, those folks are still down there, they still have those jobs, they're still participating in civic life. Uh, one of them you know, is trying to, trying to run for city council to continue to push policies. I think you know, over the long term, you know, good community organizing is, is meeting people in their interest and helping them discover the, the, the real reason that drives them to participate in these conversations in a serious way.